guys, it's Lily May coming to you live from Las Vegas. And it's Linda Rose coming to you live from Maine. I am super excited for today's episode. We have a lot of really cool things planned. I'm just super excited. It's going to be so much fun. Me too. Um, we're doing our book discussion this today's episode, which I'm really happy about. And also, excuse the messy background. My <laughs> film room is still under, like, it's still under being fixed at the moment. We are saying it's under construction. It's not. It's just being fixed and cleaned up. So hopefully we're only here for one more week, but we're good. So today we are going to be doing our full discussion on The Nightingale. A few months ago we did our half discussion, but I am super excited to be able to talk about the full entire book. It was such an awesome book to be able to read, and I am so excited to discuss it today. Yeah, me too. It's um, It was a really good book, and I really, really enjoyed it. And I'm really happy that we, got, that we came up with this idea at the beginning of the season to do these book slash movie discussions, because they're a lot of fun. Absolutely. I've been absolutely loving them. So for today's discussion, our producer, Renee, is going to be joining us on today. Yay! Hey, thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you so much for coming on and doing this with us. Yay! I'm excited. So we'll go ahead and just hop into the discussion. Um, for the first one, we wanted to kind of give a summary of the book and our personal opinions about it. So first off, I wanted to ask everybody, what was one of the most meaningful things in the book to you guys? Um... For me, it was a huge, um, there, I mean, there are so many topics and themes I could talk about, like, um, which a lot, like, a big one was, like, love was a good one in this book, um, and strength was a good one, but the one I went in was, like, women's strength and, like, women power, um, because this book was based on World War II, and if you guys go back and you kind of, like, read history books, World War II, that time period for women was a really, like, women were really, um, I don't want to say sof not sophisticated, but like they were just kind of trapped in like these roles that they had to play. And that book, it talked a lot about like the things that women had to go through and kind of what their role was. And some of the roles they had, you had, to, women had to be very strong to be in that role, especially since women, even today, but back then it was so much worse, women were so looked down upon that women's strength was just a big topic that stood out to me during the book. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. That was one of my favorites, too. I loved how they talked about how women are capable of anything. This book showed the theme by um, showing the different ways that women during this time period adapted to being able to take on roles that they didn't necessarily know much about. And I just really loved seeing how this theme played out throughout the entire book. I did yeah. As well. yeah, I really love that, too. And I loved how you, um, LR, how you talked about the power of women, because I actually went back and I was watching some interviews with Kristen Hanna the author. And she said almost that same thing. She said she wanted to do profiles of women of courage because she felt like this was a book that she wanted to read, but no one had written it. So she felt compelled because women throughout history have sort of been in the shadows and they have all of the same, you know, duty and sacrifice and courage and bravery and strength. And they give up so much, including their lives, just like men, but we don't often know their names. They often are forgotten. So she wanted to make sure that the, the strength of women and their sacrifice, um, as well as their relationships, and to tell it through that female lens of the female narrative, which is so often left out of literature and TV and films. So it's so great that we have a female author writing about female relationships um, and through the female um, eye. So I thought that was really great. But definitely courage is the one that stuck out stuck out to me too. Absolutely. And I'm going to need to watch that interview that she did because I think that that would be so cool to watch. And it's definitely true that there are not a lot of books written about women's experiences in World War II. And Kristen Hanna is such an awesome author. And she's somebody I would dream to be able to interview on here. Oh, yeah. Well, we could, you never know. That could happen in season three. Yeah. For our next one, I want, we want to talk about what our favorite quotes were. My personal favorite quote from the book was, why was it so easy for men in the world to do as they wanted and so difficult for women? I think this quote really shows the struggles that many generations of women have had to overcome and still have to deal with. And it's really difficult for women to get the same recognition and respect and women are often not taken as seriously. And this quote just really shows that this is an issue that women of all ages have had experience with. 
Yeah, absolutely. And um, I there were so many memorable quotes. It was really hard to choose. So I kind of have two. One of them is the one that people quote a lot, which is when she talks about how love brings out what we want to be and the war and war brings out what we become, what we really are, who we really are is revealed during war. And I think that she really revealed that. I think the author did a good job of painting um, the struggles that these characters had to go through, particularly the two sisters, the things they have to give up um, and their narratives and their identities, what they think of themselves gets challenged. All of their weaknesses come uh, come to bear, you know, um, and it's almost like over the course of the whole novel, they get closer together. You know, um, Vianne has to learn how to be more bold and more courageous and take more risks. And Isabel needs to maybe learn how to maybe temper some of some of that and be a little bit more cautious uh, here and there. So it's interesting to see how different they are as sisters. Um, but the other one I really liked was from Isabel. And it's when she, she meets um, Gaetan and she said, uh, beauty was just another way that people discounted her. But Gaian, Gaetan looked past that and he was looking at her as a human being and saw that there was more than something beautiful there. And I don't, it was kind of a lesser quote, but to me, it really resonated because so many times women are judged on the basis of their bodies. And Isabel really talks about this was, one of the reasons why she felt so connected to him and why she took that risk to be a, a proactive um, resistor of the war. And I thought that was really cool. And it just reminded me of all the body positivity conversations that we've had. And this book did a really great job of showing multidimensional, full-bodied characters that are women. And again, so often female characters are just sort of discounted by either beauty or they're summed up by one dimension. Absolutely. And I love that topic too. And those quotes are so powerful and so impactful. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I do remember the first quote that you mentioned, which I feel like when you read it, it's just, I mean, so many people say it all the time, but like when yep. you read it, that's just a quote that like, you just can't forget mm -hmm. pretty much. And the one that I had, I'm a huge, I don't know why I always have been, I'm a huge, like, like, uh, Romeo and Juliet, how they weren't supposed to be together, but they did anyways. I'm a huge fan of, like, that, like, fighting through the barriers to be together with the person yes. that you care for and that you love for. And a huge one that I just, because that's what I read all the time, and that's one of the things I love so much. Um, the quote that I had was, with all the risks they were taking, love was probably the most danger dangerous one of all. And I just, with being in when like your family or people around you don't agree with the relationship or the people that you love and obviously you can't control who you love and with people that you care about the opinion that they have not agreeing with that can be super super hard so taking that risk to be together is really really important and something that really shows how much you care for the other person Wow, that you know what that was almost a quote that I chose too because I'm very passionate about that topic and very passionate about society and families and individuals encouraging people who want to be together however they love that we should always support that and not end up with you know because Ro Romeo and Juliet could have been a comedy instead of a tragedy it was only a tragedy because of the way that society and the families acted which is why it's so the definition of tragedy and we see that play out in the LGBTQ um, community we saw it with um, racial relations uh, particularly in this country just people not allowing people to be with those that we love. And so that, that quote was really beautiful. Absolutely. It was such a powerful quote. And this book just seriously had so many really great quotable themes. And it was just so interesting to get to hear your guys' favorites too. Yeah. Um, so the next thing is, who would you, would you recommend this book and who would you rec recommend this book to? I think I would recommend this book for teens and adults uh, because it covers and helps inform people about things that aren't talked much about, about this type of history in history books, which is women's roles in the war. And this book is also, as a bonus, it's super historically accurate, and it was such a good representation of the experiences that women had in World War II. So I would definitely recommend it to teens and any adults. Yeah, definitely. yeah, I wrote I when I was writing it because I have to write everything down and when I was writing that's pretty much exactly what I wrote. I would recommend it to um, teens and adults 
um, who really just want to learn more, who haven't learned enough about what it was like from back then and how things have changed, but a lot of things have only gotten a tiny bit better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, I was thinking about it and I, I definitely think that anybody would be interested in this book. There's a reason why it's so popular and people all over the globe are reading it of all different ages and genders. Um, but I would particularly, I want to see a lot of um, men to reading this book because I think it's a great way to introduce males to how women characters actually think and how women authors um, actually portray real female characters. I mean, I thought it was very authentic with the female experience. And I think that men could really learn a lot about that and um, empathize with the characters. And I think it would do a lot for a lot of healing between, you know, men who, and maybe men who are not really there yet at totally appreciating everything that women go through. I think if they read this book, they're going to come out with a lot of respect for the bravery and strength of women. I think that's a really awesome topic that you brought up too, because I think that definitely this book, anybody should read it just because it gives a really good insight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, I was wondering what stood out to, the, uh, to you guys about the book? Um, what, I, what I was thinking about when I was reading it is how mature the book was written. Um, it was in a very, it was written in such a mature manner and it really didn't hold back from the topics that needed to be talked about and, um, people who need, like, like the three of us here, like people that, who talk about the topics that need to be talked about, like all the issues that women go through, you have to be really mature for that and you have to be able to say things the right way because you don't, you don't want to offend somebody else and you have to be able to word things the way that you need to need to basically you need to word things that are gentle but also still so strong worded and um i think that i think this book did a great job with that absolutely something that stood out to me was that it can be relatable to a super wide audience because of the diversity of the main characters there's like a young teen protagonist and there's also an older protagonist and i just think this is really great because it helps create a di diversity in the book and makes it more relatable to a wider uh audience range yeah that's that's really true um what stood out to me was sort of going back to that quote about war bringing out who you really are. And I just kept thinking about that. And in the book, you see again and again, characters push to their limits. And I mean, you you really, you know, you see Vianne like having to decide, is she going to risk her child's life to protect a stranger? You know, all of these ethical quandaries, you're just pushed to your limits and you're terrified. And there's so much going on around you you have to find you have to dig deep and find out who you are as an individual what do you stand for what are you willing to sacrifice to do the right thing what is the right thing and i love how you see different characters making different decisions and also evolving i thought there were really good character arcs um particularly with the narrator but we're going to get to that question so i think i'll talk about that there but you know they really do evolve and they do change and and war really does flesh out who they truly are as characters Absolutely. The character development in this book was just perfect. And it was really powerful throughout the book to see how they did grow. Yeah, absolutely. For our next question, we wanted to talk about the structure that the book was written in. And we want to talk about is why do you think the author chose, author chose to keep the narrator's identity a secret in the beginning and in the end of the novel? And were you surprised by who it was? Um, I think that the narrator's identity at the beginning was kept a secret to kind of keep people thinking about the intro, just because it had a lot of really powerful things that it said in the intro. And I was actually super surprised about who it turned out to be, but I did start suspecting it was Vianne near the middle-ish, but I definitely think that this helped make the book super interesting and helped to recall the intro. Yeah, yeah I... I was surprised by who it was, especially since, and the reason I think the author kept it a secret is because when you're siblings with certain people that were in the book, it's, it, when someone thinks that and that's an area, you automatically think, because that's just how the human mind works, you automatically think that they're going to be, that it's going to be a super biased story. 
-hmm. and it's going to be a super biased view of things and it's going to be a lot of people like a saying that a lot of people use is don't judge a book by its cover which is ironic because we're talking about the book <laughs> not what i mean um when it's kind of like judging a book by cover by its cover but also judging a person by who they have in their family or who they associate with and i think that's why the author kept it a secret because they wanted people to connect with the narrator without knowing who it is because having that like it's like having an online friend but not knowing who that online friend is and you really connect with them it's it's a nice way to kind of set the mood and kind of show that you can connect with them no matter who they associate with or who their family is yeah absolutely I think that's a really good point um, because I think I would have been a little bit biased probably if I did know. Um, at first, like right out of the gate, I actually did suspect it was Vianne, but then I thought the author did a really great job of sort of faking you out and mixing it up and putting different clues in there so that by the end, I was genuinely surprised again. But initially out of the gate, I did think it was Vianne. But the thing about the, nar I love the device that she used using that narrator because it gave us this window, especially when you finish it and you know for sure that it's VN, it gives you this great window into how she changed. And you sort of don't judge her because a lot of times when I was reading the book, I judged VN, and we're gonna talk about this in our next question, but I kind of did judge her sometimes as seeming a little bit too passive, you know? And um, again, I'm looking backwards in history and I'm saying, oh, I wouldn't have done it that way or whatever. But it's cool because the narrator is very philosophical and a lot of the great quotes from the book come from that narrator and those little vignettes that we get, those windows into what she's going through now at the end of her life and how she views things looking back on the war and the guilt that she feels, the regret she feels about certain things. And um, so I thought it was a really great device and it's one I might want to use for my writing now because... Uh, it definitely did connect us more to her without being able to judge her because we didn't know for certain who it was until the very end. Absolutely. I thought the structure really brought a lot to the book. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, who do you identify more with out of the two sisters? There's Vianne and Isabel. I think both the characters are really great and they both had super powerful influences on the book. But I do really admire Isabel a little uh, because of how brave and outgoing she is and how she's not afraid to speak up and stand for what she believes in. I think there's something we can all learn from her. Yeah, I, for me, with both, I have, I get both sides of how they both reacted to the war. And for me, I can resonate with both so well because there are times like, Vianne being you know so it's just they were both so outgoing and but some in my mind I get shy in certain areas and in my mind there's so many things I want to say but I keep them or do in those certain situations but I keep them in my mind because you know everybody gets that nervous like what happens if I say this or what will happen if I do this and um with Vianne being so with Isabel being so outgoing and the end being so not during the war, it's I just resonate with both so much that I could go both ways. Yeah, um, I, I get that. And I, I appreciated that more as I went into went over the book. But Isabel really tugged at my heart, you know, even when she's at school and they're like teaching her manners and, you know, fork or spoon and all of that sort of etiquette. And she's going, don't you see there's a war going on? Like there's things so much more important. But we also have to remember that because of the age gap and because she was unmarried and without children, the stakes were totally different for her. So she had different things that she was putting on the line. Whereas Vianne, she's older, she has a child, she had different priorities because, you know, when you're a mother like that and your husband is gone off, you know, you don't know what's going to happen to him. You have to make different decisions. And so I think I appreciated that more um, as I read the book. But I do think that um, just intrinsically, you know, I do like the proactive kind of sassy nature of Isabel. And, and I could sort of see myself in there, you know, questioning everything and sort of wanting to be a doer and to go out and like really solve things and, and sacrifice and put yourself physically on the line more. Whereas Vianne, you know, she... She was willing to, you know, at first she really felt, I think, like she could just ride this out and just be quiet and just sort of go, you know, go along. But as time went on, she started digging deeper and deeper and her conscience started biting at her. And 
I think that her her journey might be a little bit more relatable to some people. And I thought that that was inspiring to see how she ends up really conquering a lot of her passivity. Absolutely. I think both the characters really brought their own aspects into the book, and it was just super impactful to see how both of them grew throughout the book. Yeah. And um, for our next topic, for our last topic, actually, of the discussion, we wanted to talk some about how the book portrayed women's roles during the war. This book captures many of the area's attitudes about many women. Isabel, for example, is told that women don't go to war, and Vianne is confused by her new wartime role as a provider. And so for uh, the last uh, topic to discuss, I wanted to see how have, uh, what do you guys think, how have gender roles changed since World War II? I... Obviously, th- so much has been fixed and or has gotten better, but there are like, and you'll see it in a few of our interviews that women still doing certain things are still so frowned upon, and like there's still and there's still so many people that like think like the kitchen and the housework's a women's job and going out and making money is a man's job, and there's still people that think like that, and there's still, unfortunately, there's still like that's still a thing where you know women clean and they do the kitchen stuff and all that and men go out and they work and basically they get their hands dirty while the women just keep everything nice and neat and take care of the children and as much as gender roles have gotten better there's still so much that could be changed that unfortunately just hasn't been yet yeah, absolutely. Gender roles have changed since World War II, but in a lot of ways, they've also stayed the same. Like you were saying, women are still not valued as highly as a man doing uh, the same work or something. And it's super disappointing and really makes no sense. Society still holds a lot of the same notions about women working or women doing tasks that could be traditionally considered a male's role. And this is super frustrating, and it's definitely enlightening to read a book like The Nightingale and notice some of the issues that women still have to deal with that they did deal with. Uh, later in history. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree with what both of you said. It's it's so true that um, so much has changed, um, you know, globally and in America and in France, you know, definitely the women's liberation movement, feminism, all of that came afterwards. But um, as we've seen, actually, misogyny right now is, is back on the rise again. There's sort of a pushback. And then if you go globally and you look at um, Iran, for instance, or different places in the world, there, there's a lot that women are having to 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 go through. That is, um, it's really hard still to be a woman. And then even in America, if you see the news cycle, you're going to see that women's essential, basic human rights are being tugged away from us every single day. So I I don't want to discount all of the brave women who have you know, come up and fought for women's lib and for equality because we absolutely have made a lot of progress. But we have to remember that progress is something and freedom is something, equality is something that we have to continually fight for actively every single day, because otherwise people will always try to take that away from us. Absolutely. And that was a super powerful point to bring up. Thank you. I agree with you 100%. And like Lily said, amazing point to bring up. And I'm really happy that you brought it up and talked about it. Thank you. This was such an awesome discussion. Thank you guys all so much. For anybody who wants to read the book that was maybe interested from our discussion, we have the link to it in the description. And before we start our new segment, we just wanted to quickly announce uh, we are going to be doing our movie discussion next month. And we picked the documentary Miss Americana on Netflix. This was such an awesome documentary. I've watched it. It talks, uh, it's a documentary Taylor Swift made, and it talks a lot about females' experiences in the music industry. Yeah, it's super powerful. I, I started to watch it, and then I just never finished it just because I got busy. But now I'm going to go back and, and, and finish it. But there are some amazing moments in there, and I've also seen clips of it. Very, very inspiring, and I think everybody's going to get a lot out of it. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm so glad you guys picked it. I'm so excited. Yeah, it was it was an awesome one to watch. Yeah, I haven't even started watching it yet. But I'm before we came on the show, Lily brought up the idea of watching it and for our movie discussion and I'm so excited that she brought it up because I'm so <laughs> excited to watch it. Yeah, it's gonna be great. Yeah. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with our new segment. For our first news topic tonight, we wanted to talk about what the new caucus in Congress has been doing to amplify the voices of schoolgirls in Iran. Um, Linda Rose, why don't you open the news segment today? 
Um, with, we, can, I have a sh hard time wording it because there, for me, being a, being a girl in school, I have very, very different experiences. And it's not just, it's because one, I live in America and even though there is so much misogyny in America, I do have a lot more rights and that comes from my skin color, where I grew up. Um, and just kind of my entire society that I'm in and I'm so happy that I have those I have those opportunities that I get but there's so many other countries where being a girl in school is really really difficult and where misogyny is how they live and um, with different countries not having with other people not having the opportunities that I have it's hard for me to word things because I don't like it's hard for me to talk about it because I don't know what it's like to live that way mm -hmm. and I've only heard from different stories from other people that have lived that way and my heart feels for them so much and it's hard for me to talk about because I don't want to it's something that me and my grandmother Emma talk about so much it's hearing those stories it it it's really sad to hear them especially since like talking about them you have to be so careful because I don't know what it's like to live that way um, and especially for girls in Iran it's there's been a huge problem there we talked about Iran for multiple different episodes through season one to season two and for the girls in Iran there's things that are happening that I don't agree with that a lot of people don't agree with and I'm so happy that they're doing these protests and but for schooling for them um, it, it's gonna be hard but it's also they're doing so well with all their protests that they're doing and keeping up with staying strong. And it's something that I hope that at some point no one has to go through. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So right now, a new bipartisan caucus is condemning the Iranian government over the recent poisoning of Iranian schoolgirls. Representative Sheila Jackson announced the formation of the Iranian Women Congressional Caucus with the support of nearly 20 members of the House. And this Congressional Caucus includes more than 12 members who plan to draft legislation that focuses on women's rights in Iran. And I thought hearing about this new caucus being formed was just really great. And I hope that they do a lot of work to help uh, women in Iran. Yeah, and I'm so happy to see this bipartisan and that both parties, you know, people are coming together. Um, there's been thousands, maybe up to anywhere between a thousand to five thousand uh, girl school girls in Iran who have been poisoned since late last year. And one has died. One con one confirmed has died who was only 11 years old. And it's some kind of a um, toxic gas that is odorless and tasteless and there's multiple perpetrators and the government there in Iran is pretending that they're so upset and they've made arrests or whatever. But the truth is, is that it's the culture and the political system in Iran that is fostering this type of stuff against girls and women. One of the theories is that the girls are, of course, being targeted for kind of like what LR was touching on, you know, just for the fact that they are being educated. There are a lot of people in that part of the world who do not think that girls should be receiving an education because this will lead to further education and power and change. And they don't want that. They do not, they do not want women to be educated or intellectual because then they will think for themselves and they won't want to go along with this system. So, um, it's, it's just a really terrifying thing and it is continuing and so I'm really just like uh, Lily said, you know, I'm really glad that both Republicans and Democrats are stepping forward in America to say, hey, we're going to take this really seriously and try to do something to help protect girls in Iran. Absolutely. And it's been so disappointing to hear all the stories and it's just so terrible. And yeah, it's so make sure if you guys come across any articles or stories, it's so important that we share it just because it's not being talked a lot about on major news networks and it just needs to be brought to attention more. Right. Mm -hmm. So for our next topic, there has been so many steps back made in transgender rights in the last few months. We wanted to take a second to talk about the latest bill announced that is attempting to take away even more rights from transgendered people. 
House Republicans have recently passed a bill that would prohibit schools that receive federal funding from allowing transgender women to participate in school sports that are designated for women and girls. This bill would affect elementary through college sports, and this bill is unlikely to pass the Senate. But all of these bills and laws that are being proposed that attempt to, to take away rights from transgendered individuals are just going to prompt other states to pass legislature that is similar. And this is why it's so important that we keep talking and informing people about this topic, because like a lot of the topics we talk about on Orchid Times, it's not being covered by major uh, by major news networks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, with, can we just like, I think I'm pretty sure a lot of people that watch our show will agree. The laws that are trying, that our people are, are attempting to be passed right now are targeted towards women and LGBTQ members to make, to, it feels like they're targeting LGBTQ members and women so that men control, that they can go back to controlling them like how it used to be. And for women, for me and for LGBTQ members, I sort of feel trapped in the fact that they're trying to pass these laws and take away rights from me and for LGBTQ members. Because everyone's, because the government's always saying that they want everybody to have a voice and that they want everybody to have a role. But at the same time, it's mostly men that have the voice that have the role. No matter how much they say it, saying it and do and saying it, and making sure that it actually happens are two different things. And right now, all the government is doing is saying it. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, it's like a lot of times you'll see somebody who pretends to be an ally or even um, a woman. Uh, we lost LR, but I'm sure she'll be right back. No. I'm sure she'll be right back. Um, but yeah, it, it's what LR was saying. You know, you have to really put your actions behind your words. And if you say that you believe in women's rights or in trans rights or in LGBTQ plus rights, are you really living that? Are you are you truly doing things or are you electing the same people over and over again who are trying to pass legislation like this? And Lily, you know, you did mention that this is unlikely to actually pass the Senate. Um, and I know President Biden already said he's definitely going to veto it if it ever came on, it, on his desk. But again, like you said, this is a part of the, the larger culture war where essentially they're trying to instill fear. And that's what LR was re reflecting upon is that she's feeling trapped. It's basically trying to scare, use scare tactics. And again, like what you said, Lily, to start a spark that other, that states will pick up on and, and all of that. So it's really disappointing to see this line of uh, headlines that keeps coming up every single day. Um, and I keep checking the calendar to see what year we're living in, because it seems like we're going back in time. And it's just so distressing. Um, yeah, it definitely feels like that. And again, with what you're saying, how the spark is catching on for other states to pass the same type of laws. We're seeing this on a lot of other fronts too, especially with the new anti-abortion legislature that is being introduced, including the six-week abortion ban that right. some states have been passing and many state representatives have introduced. And North Dakota's governor just sat, recently signed a six-week abortion ban into law. And we're just right. seeing more of these being passed, like in Florida and the the one that Nebraska uh, announced. And yep. yeah, it's just, it's really important that we keep on raising awareness for these. Exactly. Yeah. I, I LR. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, we're having a rainstorm right now. And I was hoping that we'd be able to get through the entire live without a power connection issue with <laughs> Wi Fi, but it kicked off, but it kicked back on. So we're good. Um, for our last topic tonight, we wanted to discuss some of the recent restrictions passed in Idaho. Um, Renee, did you want to lead on this one? Yeah. So Idaho, um, basically, they are the they. Hold on, let me look at my notes because we we're also doing North Dakota here. Oh, this is the travel ban. Okay, so this is they're the first state to do this. This is really I had to read several times about this before I believed that it was actually true. So they are criminalizing anyone who helps a pregnant minor to go out of state to receive any sort of abortion um, at all. It can be either oral abortion or the surgical abortion. But if you do that, you can receive two, between two to five years in prison. I mean, this is these are felonies. So Idaho is really stepping up um, to say, look, it's not even about what you do here in the state. If you aid and abet anybody leaving the state to procure an abortion, 
you can actually go to prison. This is very intense. This is not the norm. And um, it's something we need to be paying attention to. And I don't hear a lot about it in the news, which is kind of eerie. Yeah, absolutely. This law is so disappointing and it's really concerning. And many lawmakers are worried that Idaho could become an example to other anti-abortion lawmakers. And we could begin to see more and more of these very, very extreme bills being introduced. A big yeah. Yeah, a big thing for me with the whole abortion thing is that the people that are passing these bills are mostly men. And I would, something I don't usually say stuff like this when it comes to this, for me personally, if it were a male as a woman, males are now, and if it were a woman, if they were a woman and they were pregnant because if they were a minor and they got pregnant because of a sexual assault or rape or because something went wrong when they were having sex, like, how would you, how would they feel if it was women deciding whether they could get an abortion or not? Whether they could go out of state to help, to help their health. For me, I know for a fact that if it was men going through this, they wouldn't be happy. So the fact that they're doing it to us is so... Like it's it's so angering for me because I I know that if it was them they would be just as mad. So it's again like I said earlier it's it's trapping women into it's trapping women into thinking sex is something that is so like it's something that is so like down. I don't know how to explain it. It's like so it's something that like a lot of people don't talk about because it's frowned upon by a lot of people and making these abortion laws and saying because they're exaggerating it so much and trying to like take away these rights it's it's gonna make younger girls or people like scared me and mm talk about all the time it's gonna make them scared to think that like having sex is something that should never happen and it's something unfortunately that is so frowned upon already that doing these laws and trying to take away women's rights is gonna make it more frowned upon yeah, absolutely. And um, for our last topic tonight, we talked about it and touched a little bit on it earlier, but North Dakota's governor signed a strict six-week six abortion ban into law. And this law is really similar to what was passed in Florida and what was proposed in Nebraska. Abortion would only be allowed in cases of rape or in medical emergencies. This recent six-week abortion ban is the perfect example of how other states will begin to pass the same type of legislature. And it's really disappointing to see more of these attempts being made to diminish women's rights. And make sure to share any videos, articles, or stories you come across about these bills and hopes to inform more people about it. Yeah, absolutely. I agree totally. And, let, you know, again, the more that this happens, the more it's getting normalized and the more that other states are, are coming forward. So it's an epidemic. And um, that's what people predicted is, and that's why they're doing it. It's again, a part of this culture war, the political war where, um, you know, people who are anti-choice are trying to get this out there so that we will all just eventually go along. You know, they just keep banging on that door, banging on that door, hoping that we will exhaust, we will tire and eventually it will be normalized again. And it's really important that we don't go backwards in time here. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Renee, for joining on for Thank today you. for the discussion in the news segment. Thank you. I really appreciate it. That was wonderful, girls. Thank, Thank you. you. So thank you all so much for being here and for watching. I hope you all have a great evening again for our movie for uh, May, our last season, our last month of Orchid Times. We are going to be watching Miss Americana, which is a documentary that Taylor Swift did. I'm so excited. I've watched this on Netflix. It's awesome. So I'm really excited to be able to discuss it at the end of the month. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, and I hope you guys enjoyed this discussion, and I hope you guys, if you guys read The Nightingale, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to tune in next week for next week's episode at 7 o'clock Eastern Time, and we'll see you next week. We're going to be airing an interview that we did with Liz Lieber, an awesome singer, so make sure you don't miss it. It's a really great interview. Thank you all so much for being here. See you next Wednesday. Bye. Thank you.